Thank you, Dr. Brenna. And now I'd like to bring up Dr. Susan Carlson. Uh, she will be uh, presenting on the topics of uh, preterm birth and the um, benefits of making sure that you have enough DHA for, for moms. Thank you, Linda. So I think the, the punchline of, I'll just tell you the punchline of my story, which is that these nutrients that are in seafood are not just good for cognitive development of the offspring, but they're actually good for the pregnancy itself. And so we're going to be talking about preterm birth and where that story stands right now, because there have been two major trials published in the last couple of years. And they've, they've kind of given us some insight into the story. <clears throat> So I want to talk about preterm birth and why we care about it. Uh, DHA intake from the diet is low, and especially in people who don't consume seafood. Uh, and then I'll talk about the result and conclusion, just mention of the 2018 Cochrane Review, uh, which came out while well, there were two major trials underway, the ORIP trial and the ADORE trial. We conducted the ADORE trial in uh, three sites in the United States, and the ORP trial was conducted in Australia. <clears throat> and then in the end, uh, because I'm going to be talking about measurement of status, which involves getting blood and measuring this nutrient DHA in the blood, I want to ask, can baseline DHA intake be used as a pragmatic way to determine women who could benefit from the higher dose of DHA during pregnancy? And we have some data on that score right now. So preterm birth is birth before 37 weeks gestation. It's about 10% of all births in the world, 15 million births worldwide. It's the major cause of infant mortality in the world, especially in the developing world. And it's a major cause of smaller brain growth associated with cognitive loss. <clears throat> Early preterm birth, which uh, has been, it was the, the specific aim of both of these trials, Orip and Adore, to reduce birth before 34 weeks gestation. It's approximately 2 to 3% of births in the developed world. But these are the infants who, in the developed world, end up in our NICUs and get this whole uh, litany of diseases like necrotizing enocolitis, BPD, ROP, uh, all of the things that preterm babies are subject to. And of course, they're subject to developmental delay and death compared to late preterm infants. So those ones that go home a little early that are born before 34, between 34 and 37 weeks. So this is just a message to which you, obviously everyone in this audience understands that few foods are good sources of DHA. And in general, intake is low in persons who do not consume seafood or take some kind of a supplement that contains DHA, like a fish oil or an algal oil. <clears throat> so this Cochrane Review um, looked, this took nine RCTs. It's a huge meta-analysis. There were 5,204 participants involved in these nine trials. And what they concluded was that Omega-3 fatty acids, which include DHA and eicosabentanoic acid in seafood, there was high quality evidence that there was a 42% reduction in early preterm birth uh, with supplementation. Preterm birth was also reduced, and there were about 27 trials involved there with twice as many participants, but there was an 11% reduction in preterm birth. The studies were largely driven by studies that provided greater than 500 milligrams of DHA. And the conclusion when you have strong evidence in a Cochrane review is that no further trials are needed. But as I said, there were two trials underway at the time. So this was published in 2018. The ORUP trial was published about a year later, and our trial was published earlier this year. And, and I think it's been important because one of the messages I'm going to share with you next, again, I like to give the punchline in case you don't get my slide, but uh, is that it really, what has happened uh, since the studies that were in the Cochrane Review were conducted is that women have begun to take prenatal supplements. So prenatal supplements with DHA have entered the market in the developed world and we find many women are taking them. And I think they've affected the results of these trials, which, which will help me maybe explain why we found what we did. So the Australian trial was a huge trial. 
uh, again, a primary outcome was to reduce early preterm birth. And they gave 800 milligrams of DHA w with a supplement. It was a fish oil that had 100 milligrams of EPA. Women were enrolled before 20 weeks. Uh, they had done an earlier trial called the Domino trial in which they found a significant reduction in early preterm birth. But what they found in this trial was a no effect finding, which kind of shook them up, I'm sure, after many years of doing this trial to find there was no benefit. But what they did in their secondary analysis, they found that women in the lowest two quartiles of status at enrollment did benefit from the high dose supplementation with a significantly fewer early preterm births. What was concerning uh, about their analysis, and I'll have more to say about this after I talk about our trial, is that women in the highest quartile of DHA status at enrollment appeared to have an increased risk of early preterm birth. And it was relative to the control group because women who with high status, it didn't make, they, they had a 2%, um, whatever their status, they had about a 2% early preterm birth rate. But uh, this is bad. And it's gotten a lot of attention around the world. And so we, of course, wanted to address this in our trial. So, so the ADORE trial assessment of DHA to reduce early preterm birth was conducted between 2016. And it concluded uh, earlier, well, I guess late in 2020. I'm getting my years mixed up with COVID. It was a phase three RCT, double blind, multi-site adaptive design superiority trial. When we say superiority, it's because we were comparing 1,000 milligrams of DHA to 200 milligrams of DHA, which is the amount that's in many prenatals. So uh, we, we did not feel women would enroll who were taking DHA and be willing to be assigned to a placebo. And we already had data that we had published showing that in an earlier trial, even women taking 200 milligrams were benefiting from getting 200 milligrams with a lower early preterm birth. So it also didn't seem ethical to us to do that. Um, we enrolled 1,100 participants. Uh, the last number 1100 was enrolled the day before they told us we need to stop recruiting because of COVID in March of 2020. We had intended to go to 1,200. But uh, we did not. Uh, I'll just mention that as an aside. So what did we find? Um, I'll talk you a little bit through this. The red line is the women assigned to 1,000 milligrams. The blue are women assigned to uh, the 200 milligrams. And as you can see from the relative risk, there was a 32% reduction in early preterm birth, but it didn't reach a conventional uh, significance of 0.95. It was 0.81. We talk about probabilities. So the probability that you benefited from 1,000 doses was, uh, or 1,000, I'm sorry, 1,000 milligrams was 80.81. It did reach a, a conventional level of significance on preterm birth. However, one of the other aspects of our trial was to look at what the woman's status was on the day we enrolled her into the trial. And when we did that, the women who were low status had a 50% reduction in early preterm birth which came closer to a conventional uh, uh, significance, and the preterm uh, pre birth overall was lower. But here's the, here's the women who started with good status. No difference, no effect of dose. Maybe a little bit of effect on preterm birth of the higher dose. So the really important question here might also be, do we see any evidence that the high dose increased risk of early preterm birth in women with high baseline status? And we were using a, a, a 6% red blood cell phospholipid DHA as our cutoff between high and low status. And that was because in the ORUP trial, this was our calculation uh, compared to their blood spot analysis, which, which we, had, we had done a comparison with the people in Australia with about 50 samples that we did the red blood cell fossil, the DHA, and they did the blood spot. So we came up with this correction factor. So this is, this is one of the things that um, uh, I'm, we, we still, of course, don't know why they're finding this negative effect. But in the first bar there in the blue is the ORUP with no DHA. The second is the, is the ORUP that got 800 milligrams. These are the women who started with high status. 
and you can see that the placebo went down by the, the orange shows their status went down, uh, but in the supplemented group it went up. But if you also compare it to our trial where we started, where the women started, and where they ended after 200 milligrams, you cannot really see any difference there. Looks like our, they started in the same status and they, they went up the same amount, and we have virtually the same rate of early preterm birth, but our group that got 1,000 milligrams started in the same place but went much higher. So in my mind, there's a question of compliance, although we're still all trying to work out what is going on here, but the bottom line is I do not believe there is any risk of giving a high dose to a woman who has good status. Okay, so uh, I'll show you quickly what happened compliance. Now in every trial, there are some people who do not do what you ask them to do, and that is also the case in this trial, and we use the red blood cell phospholipid DHA as the indicator of whether they took the supplement or not. So what, what we then looked at was, and we, we used 5.5% DHA in the red blood cell phospholipid as our indicator of compliance. This is in a protocol like this, which is done under investigational new drug and funded by the NICHD, you have to say up front what you consider to be compliant, and so we have to go by what we said when we wrote the protocol. But as you can see, the green line, those are the women who were compliant according to that measure. And you can see their rate of early preterm birth is like 1.2%. Their preterm birth rate is nearly half the rate uh, of the United States rate of preterm birth. And the red line is the women who were assigned to 1,000 milligrams, but apparently did not take it because their DHA did not go up. And they look pretty much like the control or even or the 200 milligram or even a little worse. And, and again, just looking at the probability here of the women who are compliant, uh, the probabilities go up to a more conventional level of significance like 0 0.95, 0 0.96. So do we need to know DHA status or is there a pragmatic uh, way providers can use to identify women who should be advised to consume more DHA? We did this study in our hospital and in two sites in Ohio. And when we shared it with our OBs, they're going like, I need a blood level. How do I get a blood level? Uh, this is a problem <laughs> for them. It's not easy. And it's even if they could get the blood level, uh, they'd have to find, call the woman back and you know, what, how much, you know, tell her how much she should get. So one thing we had done in our trial and another trial that was going on between 2016 and 2020 that I was involved with, but not the PI, uh, it's the, the PANDA trial had about 300 women. So we had approximately 1,400 women that we asked them when they enrolled in our study, seven questions about their intake. The first three questions are, relate to how much of this kind of fish you ate. And so they're high, High DHA fish, lower DHA, medium DHA fish, and then low DHA fish. And we gave that to everyone. And we thought, well, let's just look at this. D does that in any way explain who would benefit from the higher dose? And sure enough, women who were consuming less than 150 milligrams of DHA, from, it could have been from their diet or a supplement, on the baseline, at the baseline, or on the day we enrolled them, if they were consuming less than that, they needed to get the higher dose to get this reduction in early preterm birth. So the OB department got very excited about this. They want to implement it. But there was one problem, and that was that we had trained administrators who gave this seven question uh, questionnaire. <laughs> and you can't assume that if you just ask women to do it, they can fill it out on their own. And of course, that's another barrier. So we, we did another small study with 101 women. Uh, the, the patients are asked before their first prenatal to fill it out, and then 101 agreed to let my research associate re-interview them. And what we got from that was, um, I'm sorry, this should not be in here. What we got from that questionnaire, I know we're out of time too, uh, was a very high kappa agreement, meaning that the sensitivity and specificity 
of women filling it out on their own was very, very good. And so our next step, starting as soon as I get home, is to modify this questionnaire so the result goes to the patient. She then goes to her doctor with a message about what her level is, and we're going to try to do that for a while. So to summarize, in my last seven seconds, the Cochrane Review in 2018 concluded strong evidence that DHA EPA can reduce early preterm birth, meaning no further trials were necessary. However, these two large trials were underway. Results from both oropenadore show that this higher dose of DHA reduced early preterm birth in women with low DHA status. We agree on this. Uh, the amount of DHA in most U.S. prenatal supplements is not sufficient to optimally reduce early preterm birth in women with low baseline status. The oropenadore found no benefit of high-dose DHA for women with already good DHA status. The prenatal DHA uh, intake was likely a factor in both trials. That was not the case in studies included in the 2018 Cochrane Review. And we believe we have a pragmatic way for physicians to identify women who should receive a higher dose of DHA by screening them for low DHA intake at baseline. Uh, maybe later we'll get to measured blood levels. So we've implemented this question in our OB clinic. And thank you very much for your attention.